John Abercrombie, and I'd like to discuss with you some of my concepts and ideas for improvising, primarily in harmonic situations, standard type song progressions, more simple modal uh, harmonies, and uh, perhaps some of my own compositions or compositions that use what we refer to more as polychords, but basically primarily in a harmonic uh, situation. And the first thing I'd like to discuss is a concept I use, which everyone uses, but I think of it in a particular way. And I think of intervals. I think of going from point A to point B. And further, of course, hopefully, when you're improvising. But instead of thinking of what most people do of scales and modes and thinking of this long eight-note scale and trying to, every time you see a chord symbol, trying to relate a, uh, the scale to it, I think of, let's isolate a chord. Let's take a chord we want to get to know, or a sound to become familiar with it. And one way is to just sort of deal with that isolated sound and not a progression. And think of intervals. By intervals, I mean from an A flat to a C, an interval of a third, a C to an E flat, or fifths. And for this purpose, we'd li I'd like to deal with a certain sound now and helping me out in this uh, quest for interval improvisation is my friend and colleague, John Basili. He's going to be uh, playing some chords for me. We're going to be doing some performances later on the tape, and he's also going to be quizzing me and asking me questions and try to trip me up and you know, make this a more interesting tape. So what we're going to do now is take an isolated sound. We've chosen an old friend of mine, A flat major 7, flat 5, or for those of you who must know, it's A flat Lydian, or some people like to think of it as A flat 7, sharp 4, or sharp 11. It's a sound. 
that I like to play over. And I'm just going to isolate this sound. We're going to play first out of tempo, rubato, no tempo. John is going to lay down a, a, this sound for me, and I'm just going to improvise over it using an intervallic concept. I'm not going to play scales. I'm not going to play hot licks. I'm going to play just intervals, which hopefully I'll be able to create little melodies from. And the intervals will be mixed. They'll be thirds, fourths, fifths, whatever I feel like. So. So that was a pretty simple, but pretty purely intervallic. I used mostly thirds, some fourths. Uh, towards the end, I played some sixths, and I ended with, a, with an octave, which is an interval. So I tried to keep it very pure. If you look at this concept and take this concept a little bit further, um, instead of just going from point A to point B, in other words, two notes at a time, we can deal with note groupings. Uh, which could have as many notes as you want in it, but for our purposes, or my purposes to explain this to you right now, I'm thinking more in terms of three note groups or triads. These triads can be very specific. They can be major, minor, or diminished, or augmented, but also they can be kind of non-chordal. That is, they can be built in fourths and not have a real triadic major minor sound. They could be more like uh, whatever vaguer, there's something that would fit any situation. All purpose. And right now we'd like to play, with John's going to play a, a pattern for me, which is A flat Lydian to G minor, like a bossa thing, you know. And I'm going to play in this triadic concept. That's the idea. That's sort of a little, giving a little rhythm to it so that it's not all sort of floating. But this can also be practiced out of tempo, too. The main idea behind a lot of the things I'm trying to get across in this video is to try and hear what you play. That's why I'm making it so simple in terms of intervals and triads. Because very often, we're, like I say, we're dealing with scale. Every time you see a chord symbol, you see a scale. How can I get this scale in there? How can I fit all these things in? Well, you can't. There's no time. It's impossible. And it's pointless, too. So it's better to create melodies and take small particles and build towards making larger lines. I wouldn't, if the way I've improvised for you now, I wouldn't improvise totally for a whole song. This is something else. This is a way to get going. It's one aspect of the whole thing. John, could you yeah, get John. more specific where the, where the where do you find the triadic material? Where does it come from, harmonically? It comes from... From, from a mode, from a scale? Yeah, from I, 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 I'd like not to use those terms, yeah. but unfortunately, I mean, we have to because it's just a way to communicate where things come from and what they are. In this case, they come from modes or scales, but also they come, I think, in terms of more chord tones. Mm -hmm. In other words, if we're talking about A-flat, 7, flat, 5, what are the notes in the chord? Mm -hmm. You know, A-flat, C, E-flat, and G, and a D is the flatted fifth or sharp 11. 
So you take these notes, if you only dealt with those notes, you could break those notes up into triads and you could find out what you'd get. You know, you'd get like, yeah. you know, you get G minor, you know, and you get A flat, of course, and you get B flat. These are just dealing with some of the chord tones and the added scale tones. That being the scale and the... Yeah. It's obviously just taking bits and pieces and breaking them up. It's another way to look at it as small arpeggios. Mm -hmm. This combined with intervals and scaled passages give you a lot more information that you can create melodies with and improvise so that you're not improvising in a totally scalar fashion. And it allows you to hear more of what you play, I think. You start to hear what the chord tones sound like as opposed to a non-chord tone. Or you know what the ninth of a chord sounds like, the flatted fifth. And it's funny, it seems like you're almost like you're limiting your playing, but you're actually expanding it by limiting Yeah, I guess you could, it, you, know? you could say that. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about and demonstrating in this um, tape have to do with limitations because I realize limitations do expand you. Mm -hmm. By limiting yeah. yourself, you, you're yeah. kind of encapsulating something. and You're looking at it in, in a more uh, precise way. It's like, it's like putting something under a microscope. Mm -hmm. It's like, here's the chord, here's the sound, here's the scale. But let's take this and, you know, like take a little sample of it, right? And we'll put it on the slide. We'll stick it under the microscope and we'll look at it and say, oh, there's G minor is in there. Oh, there's a nice interval, you know. My God, look, it's like looking at bacteria that make up your, you know, uh, your improvising yeah, process. It's, it's, and these little germ, actually another way, you've all probably heard the phrase, you know, like starting with a little germ of an idea. Well, maybe it's real, you know, maybe they are real, musical germs. Yeah, it makes your playing real conversational too. You know, it's yeah. almost like a that call and response type stuff. You know? Yeah. It's nice. Another concept which is similar to what we've been talking about, or I guess you could look at it as an extension of what we're talking about, intervals, triads. But this is something that I want to deal now with a fuller chord progression. Up until now, we've, been, we've just been talking about a static chord, or maybe in the case of the little rhythm thing that John played for me, it was A flat to G minor. Now it's going to be an extended chord progression. And I'm going to play another, it's another limitation. You'll find these all through the tape. This is one where you limit yourself to only playing two notes per measure, no matter what the chord progression is. So in this case, I'm going to take a tune that we, hopefully we all know. I learned it years ago, and it's become a jazz player's standard tune to play. It is a standard tune. Um, it's called Stella by Starlight. And I'm going to improvise in a two-note fashion, pretty much on the beat. In other words, you, if you looked at it on music paper, you'd just see half notes, pure and simple. But because I'm an improviser, I probably won't be able to stick exactly to that, uh, that format. And also, I don't know if my, my rhythm is good enough to play exact half notes that you could measure out on a metronome. But that'll be the basic concept. I'll count a tempo. First, I'll play one chorus by myself. And then John is going to join me and, and comp for me. And then we'll continue on from there. So this is, I don't really have a name for this. I guess you'd call it the old, the old two-note approach. And remember, when you're playing two notes, one of the ideas behind playing two notes is that since, again, you're dealing with sm this very small intervallic concept, your note choices better be good. You can't fill it up with a lot of extra scale notes. You know, you can't do a lot of um, hot, uh, hot things. It has to be this pure and simple melody. So you've got to choose good notes. Okay, so I'm going to count a tempo. I'm going to internalize it and feel it. And hopefully you'll feel it, too. And then I'm going to improvise in this uh, one chorus by myself and one chorus with John. Okay? I'll see you at the end. And I'll see you in the second chorus. Right. One, two, one, two, three, four.
almost got lost. Because what I was doing, which is, I hope was kind of obvious, was instead of playing right on the beat, when John started to play, I started to take more liberties. I started to like, one, two, three, four, do, de, do, de, do. I was anticipating notes, so I'm kind of tying them over in my mind. And a lot of what I do is, is done through intuition and how it feels. So I've never really come up with an exact concept that I could write down on paper and say, if you do this and practice this and you practice this and call me in the morning, you know, and you'll find that you're going to be playing through changes a whole lot better the next day. You know, it's not going to happen like that. So I was taking liberties, rhythmic liberties with the notes, but I was still trying to choose notes that fit the chords. I wasn't thinking of scales, I was thinking more of chord tones. And it, gave me a, it, it gives you a chance to really concentrate on the notes you play, and it teaches you about how to melodically voice lead, if there is such a thing. You know, you, you've always heard about chord voice leading, but this is melodic voice leading. How does the next note move into the next note through, the, through a progression? It's different when it's on a more static sound. You know, you have more time and not as many chords to deal with. But when it's a progression, this stuff is moving by pretty fast. That's why I think it's good to limit yourself because you start to hear the sounds of what you're playing really clearly and strongly. It also helps to strengthen your time. If you're dealing with two notes, you have to be more conscious and aware not only of the notes you're playing, what, th what their function are and what they sound like, but where they fall in the rhythm. Everything becomes more important because there's less of it. So in a way, less is more, but there's less of it. Which it creates more, you have to be more careful in what you're doing. So it puts you more inside the music, more in tune, in a fun, in a different kind of way. Um, to move on a little bit further in this concept would be what I call the melodic bass line approach. I know that may sound funny, but it's rhythmically, think like a bass player. But since I have six strings and I'm able to access all these crazy frets, I can keep the same idea of a bass player walking four beats to a bar, like one, two, three, four, ding, ka dang, ding. But instead of just the four beats uh, being played as a bass player would play them, I'm a, I will play them melodically. In other words, I will play on upper strings and move around and try to create quarter note melodies. Again, I'm going to choose this song, Stella by Starlight. I will play first by myself a chorus, walking these melodic bass lines, and then John will join me. Maybe we'll play a couple of choruses after he joins me. Because okay. I want to show how this <clears throat> thing kind of grows. OK, so again, I'll count a tempo. And I got it one chorus, and then John joins me. Okay. One, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> That's, I hope that's kind of clear. I mean, this is, again, 
the pulse is more like a bass player might play, but a bass player might play more in the function of a bass, like, you know, more in the lower strings and play things that would, a bass player would play, more supportive. This is taking that idea and extending it into the upper registers and making quarter note melodies. And you find if you practice this way for a while, what actually happens, it's a strange thing, you, in a way you kind of become bored with what you're doing. You reach a certain point where you can't play in the scale anymore and you, and you, you can't play in rhythm anymore. You need to find a way to break out of it. Maybe I could give a little example of that. Like in other words, I'm going to be playing the 4-4, four, four, but, but then I'll start to, it's like rhythmically altering what I did with the two notes. In the previous example, this is doing it with the four notes. Let me, I was doing some of it as we played, but let me demonstrate, maybe at a slower tempo. That was a little, you know, some liberties I was taking, or quite a few liberties, actually. I was trying to, like, just use the quarter note uh, idea, the pulse, to generate improvisation. I wasn't staying with it all the time. I was accenting it in different places. I was playing it a little turned around. I was using other devices, like triplets, because it's hard to, for me sometimes just to play, oh, now I'm only going to play quarter notes, or give myself that much of a limitation. But I think it... You can see what it does. It's another way to hear through chord changes. You're hearing in a, in a, in a more melodic, simple way. And it's also, again, like the previous example with the half notes, it's good for your rhythm. Because you have to really concentrate not only on the, what the note is and what the direction you're moving, but the rhythm of it's very simple. You're only dealing with four notes per bar, basically. So they have to be in time. If they're not, they're going to sound really bad. You can get away maybe playing a whole bunch of notes and cover up bad rhythm, but when you deal with like half notes and quarter notes, your rhythm becomes very obvious. Either you're playing with good rhythm or you're playing with bad rhythm. Either you're dragging or rushing or whatever, you know? It puts you more in contact with the feeling of the whole thing. So I think this idea of two notes and four notes per chord, the idea of intervals, the idea of triads, these are all limiting kind of uh, devices which will basic principle behind all these things is really to get you to hear, or get me, so I the one who decided to play this way, uh, get me to hear what I play, more in touch with it. And one of the reasons I started doing this, you know, was because I played for so many years, I played, for the lack of a better word, fusion music, which I enjoyed very much, but it was devoid of harmony, this kind of harmony, jazz harmony. It was also devoid of a jazz feel. There was no, you know, like, drummers didn't play with a ding-ding-a-ding -ding swing feel. It was all like eighth note rock and roll feel. So the harmony was gone and the jazz sense of rhythm was gone. And when I came back to trying to play this music, I was found a lot of deficiencies. So to get myself centered, it's another way to look at these things, is they center yourself. It helped to center me, my rhythm, and my sense of playing on changes again. Because I had forgotten how to do it. And I wanted badly to get back to it, but it was hard to, you know, if you leave something alone, you can't just jump back into mm -hmm. it. You kind of say, oh, gee, I've been away from it for a while. It's like a, an athlete who's been away from, you know, you just say, gee, how do I do it? So you go back to bar one, mm -hmm. basics, you know, what do I practice? Well, about half notes and quarter notes, man, that's pretty basic, you know. 
So you, that led me into this, and it's improved my, uh, hopefully improved my sense of how changes move and how I improvise, and it's helped my rhythm. My time is, time feel is a lot better than it used to be. One thing about your time feel, and we've talked about it, yeah. it's got like a slippery kind of thing. Oh, I yeah. call it the rubber band. The rubber band, uh, right. And the band pulls one way, the band gets pulled another way, the other players can kind of interact in around it. Can you talk about some, um, you know, other rhythmic ideas that uh, I know you've mentioned playing on one string has always been an important part of uh, maybe developing some of this? Yeah, yeah, this is a really, the playing on one string is a really interesting one. It's, um, I, I think actually, I mean, I, I can't take credit for any of these things, obviously, but, but this one, I, I remember having discussions with an old friend of mine, Mick Goodrick, who's a wonderful player and teacher, and we were in school together, and he used to talk about playing on one string, and I believe Jim Hall has talked to me sure. about playing on one yeah. string. I think he said he used to tape some of the strings yeah. so he wouldn't, he couldn't play on them. Yeah, play a whole tune just on yeah. one string. Yeah. So think about it. Let's, why don't we, maybe we could do that. We sure. could take this, let's take this tune that we've just been dealing with. Okay, okay. And uh, this is a lot of fun. I may really mess this up, you know. We may have to do this. This may be like take 10 by the time you see it, you know. Because playing on one string is a kind of a tricky thing. But you know what, like before we do the tune, I thought of an idea. Why don't okay. we just take a static harmony and do it? I just got some something I wanted to, to demonstrate. Okay. Maybe jumping right into the tune is kind of a, a little much. Let's take a, a little harmony, something that might actually start that tune, like a, we had discussed what, like a B flat, B flat over, over B flat E. B flat over E, another one of my old friends. B flat over E. Actually, what I was doing there was I started out playing on the, only on the B string against this tonality, and then I switched to the E string and played only on the E string, and then I started to combine the two. I mean, the, the interesting thing about this kind of playing, this really is, it's almost like Indian music. You know, it's, it's like you have to find where the notes are on one string. It's like, mm. you know, you've got no pattern, you've got no scale, you've got no position. All you've got is like this one long string, and everything exists on this string. You can't play licks either. You can't play licks. How you, well, I mean, I suppose if you practiced hard enough, yeah, you could learn true, how to yeah. play licks on one string. One fingered licks. One fingered yeah. licks. But okay. I, see, but basically, I would take a scale or sound and try to work through it. So you notice I have to slide. Down to the other, other string. It instantly kind of gets you into a different frame of mind. Now we're not thinking of bebop anymore. It's, it's very melodic, and you really have to find a note on the string. Now, right now, we're just dealing with one sound, but let's say if we take this concept and we apply it to a song. And since we've been dealing with our old friend, I mean, uh, Stella by Starlight, sure. let's just keep on that one, because that's a hard tune because it moves through a lot of, a lot of keys. So I'm going to improvise with John's accompaniment on one string to Stella by Starlight. Let's say I'll play a chorus on the E string of course, on the B string, and then I'll combine the two. But never shall my fingers leave my hand. Thank you. It's the art of illusion. All right. One, two, one, two, Thank you. 
almost lost it. But that's part of what playing about is, is almost losing it, you know. Hope so. If, the, you know, if you fall down, you know, you, you have to get back up again. You know, you have to survive in the sea of chords or the, or the rhythm feel. Sometimes you, I find when you were playing like this and you, you stretch it, I mean, I may lose the rhythm of what I'm playing a little bit and have to get back, or John may lose where he is with me, or I may lose the, the harmony for a second. But it doesn't matter. And it also brings out the element of, of trust, you know, like, yeah, I was just gonna I said, say gee, that. it sounded like maybe he was a, a beat ahead. No, he's just, his time was, time feel was a little ahead of mine at one point, and I just adjusted, or he adjusted. Somehow we did it, and it all, it all worked out, and nobody yeah. was hurt. I mean, that's the main thing. Nobody, nobody gets hurt in these situations. We don't want that. And I did cheat once. I hit the G string. <laughs> but you can see how it makes you play. All of a sudden, you're playing yeah. things that you would never you could never conceivably play if you were practicing scales. They don't exist in that, in that world of running up and down the scale, no matter what degree you're going from. It's just, it's not there. It's not included. So again, this puts you really in contact with what you're hearing and what you're feeling. You have to feel your way through this stuff and you have to learn to survive. Maybe the key word, survival. The one thing that we eventually arrive at it's all important. One could say it's the foundation for it all is rhythm. So one thing I, I like to do in my playing um, is to phrase things so that they don't always fall exactly on the beat. And we always refer to uh, this in the jazz uh, vernacular as playing across the bar or over the bar line. So in other words, the phrases aren't always landing on one or specific beats. They float more. Sometimes I just think of words that, you know, see how they'd make me feel a certain way, like float. You know, that sounds different than uh, uh, another word. I mean, float has, it brings to mind an image, you know, floating as opposed to like marching or something, you know. So float, across the bar, lay back, laid back, behind the beat, on top of the beat straight down the middle. And these are all different terms that people use to describe a rhythmical feel. Maybe they'll say, yeah, boy, his, he really plays laid back. His phrases are laid back. Man, he's really behind the beat. If he got any more behind the beat, he'd be falling down. Or, you know, God, he really plays on top. He plays on top of the beat. So there always, there's all these references are to the beat. So I think a thing to do, what we'd like to do now, is, is, is play a blues. And I'm going to try to demonstrate in a very natural way, hopefully, just uh, things I, I play. It involves playing triplets, quarter note and eighth note triplets. It involves laying back behind the beat. It involves playing down the middle. It involves using different kinds of phrasing as opposed to playing like even eighth notes, like da 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 da. It has it is involved in playing like da 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 da, like a dotted eighth and sixteenth type of a feel. And it's the mixture of all these different feelings that can create a lot of swing and a lot of tension and release in, in music. So maybe we'll just play a couple of courses on a blues. I'll try to demonstrate kind of playing behind the beat and playing across the bar. Let's try those two. Okay. Just maybe a chorus or something. But it's got to be slow enough to get, all, to get this feel in. I'm, if it, the tempo is too fast, a lot of these things don't quite work. Then they become hurried and rushed. So this is like a one, a two, one, two, three. <laughs> That was a little bit of like laying back, almost like 
It's almost like fighting where John's time was, because he was like, green kitchen, and I'm like, I'm playing kind of, I'm creating tension. Mm -hmm. I'm doing what he calls the rubber band. I mean, I'm like pulling the time way back. But I don't want it to stop, but I just, it feels good, because when I pull it back, I can make it catch up. So I can play behind the beat and then gradually arrive in the center of the beat and create a lot of different rhythmic motion instead of playing the same way all the time. Uh, maybe now I'll play, we'll play another couple of courses and play a little more, try to play a little more in the center of the beat, something a little more straight ahead and show you a variation between playing very even eighth notes and a more da, 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 da bounce, a bounce feel. I don't know why I call it a bounce feel, like a, a foxtrot. Uh, but we use the same tempo and the same groove, I guess. Was it? Indeed. Yeah. So just sing one, two, three, four. <laughs> So you just trying to play a little more directly down the center that time. That doesn't feel as natural to me because I have a tendency to play behind or ahead or around, circular. But the, and the second chorus, I was trying to do a little more of the uh, difference between something, something being straight. I played a little more bounce feel. Flu, boo dee, boo da, boo dee, boo dee, dee, boo da, as opposed to be boo dee, boo da, boo da. It has a different feel. So it's in trying to mix these different feels and using triplet devices that you create all this uh, uh, tension in the rhythm, which to me actually feels very good. It's, it's a good way to play. It feels natural to me. And you put this all together, and that's kind of how I play. Another topic I'd like to discuss, which is not unrelated to what we've been doing on this tape in general, but this deals more with individual phrases as opposed to uh, intervals or the walking bass line approach, or playing on one string. This is like, let's sit down and make up a phrase. And um, this, I like to work with this in uh, two different ways. The, the first way is very similar to the way I've been working before, that is with a static harmony. I like to see what I can do with one small idea and try to milk it for all it's worth, get the most out of it. In this case, we're going to deal with a, with a harmony with John and I have both decided on uh, Another old familiar friend of, for those of you into modes, it's A Phrygian, or B flat, triad slash A. It's another way to look at it. I believe that would be correct. And I'm going to make a phrase, or come up with a phrase that really is kind of out of tempo, and then gradually find a uh, find a tempo for it or a rhythmic feeling for it. So first, it's just going to be a series of notes that I decide to put together. So John will play the, the chord for me. I'll come up with the phrase. This is all being improvised. Uh, and then I'll find a rhythmic shape for it. And then I'll take that to its next logical place, which is transposing this phrase and making it work in different, uh, different parts of the, of the scale or different parts of the sound. We'll come back to that. You'll see what I mean. So. So that's my phrase. That's the basic phrase. And that's the time, right? One, two, three, one, two. 
three, and four. So it started out kind of out of tempo. Do, de, do, de, de, Just trying to find some notes that, that fit well together that I like the sound of. It turns out that it's, it's really that. Do, de, bu, de. If you look at the notes individually, do, de, de, do, de, de. I could have played them like that. We decided to give it a little eighth note feel, so it wasn't a wasn't a, a jazz swing feel, but more of an eighth note, what we refer to as eighth note feel. And now what I'll do is take that same feel, that same phrase, and I'll be transposing it within the same sound. In other words, I'm not going to leave the key. I'm not, when I say transpose, I'm not talking about moving to another key center. I'm going to stay in A Phrygian, but I'm going to move it around and start on different notes of the key or of the chord. But keep that same phrase in mind. It'll be real obvious when I do it, I hope. Anyway, maestro, if you will, we came to tempo. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> Kind of like that. And obviously, we, as we played, I mean, we're getting into playing. And you probably notice that most of the times when I give examples, I shut my eyes. This isn't because I'm afraid. <laughs> Although why I might it? be. Why is it? Good question. Or why, why do you close your eyes? Um, I think so I close my eyes so I can get more in touch with what I'm playing. Uh, it helps me to get more, more in touch with the actual sound of the music and not be so concerned with what's around me. Uh, other times I find keeping my eyes open can be interesting. It can be interesting to try to maintain, you know, or watch someone in an audience and be playing at the same yeah, time. That's true. Yeah. It can be interesting. Sometimes it can be a total drag, especially when you're playing, you know, and there's a couple is falling asleep, you know, at the table, you know. That's not too nice. But anyway, for the most part, it's so I can get in touch with what I play. And it helps me to, uh, to know where the notes are. In other words, if my eyes are closed, I can't watch what I play. I have, again, I have to hear what I play. So if I'm in the key of A Phrygian, you know. Whoops. And I have to know where these notes are. One string again. always feel my way and know where those notes are. This is how it relates back to the other things we were talking about, the, the single string playing, the, the intervals, 
by getting all these limitations is how I arrived at this point where I see in triads. This is by using all these limited, is that a correct word? These limiting uh, ideas, I arrived at learning the guitar a lot better. So that's why I play with my eyes closed. Well, we try to tune and incorporate all yeah. these things in a performance and uh, see what happens. Sure, okay. okay. Let's see if we can first like use this, this tune, which is yeah. a standard chord progression, uh, and see what we can um, come up with in terms of a motivic way. Because this whole idea of motif sounds like somebody's name to me. Yeah, Alexander Motif. There he is. In other words, what I was doing, uh, when, and transposing it, obviously. Same rhythmic and melodic shape, just moving it to a different place in the key as John was playing. Mm -hmm. So I hope that was obvious. You now, also change that a lot rhythmically, too. You and place I, it in a different place in the bar. Yeah. You do that a lot, and it's nice, too. It's taking some one variation. idea and trying to, like, really milk it. In other words, instead of saying, oh, there's my one idea that I played on A Phrygia, now let me find a new idea to play on G7 or a new, why, why find a new idea? Why not take that germ of an idea and develop it so it fits other situations? I mean, just like this idea, if we, uh, it could be A Dorian. literally transpose it to another key. In other words, same rhythmic shape. Now it's fitting a whole new uh, harmonic area. It's not a Phrygian, it's, it's more a Dorian. So that's a more literal transposition to another key. And that on the guitar, it's obvious you can, I mean, if you have a phrase that's here, if you move it a half step or a whole step or whatever, you're transposing it into another key but sometimes you may just want to ch change one note of it. Let's see. Just gives you, a different, puts you in a different kind of perspective. It's not literally moving it into another key. Yeah. It's just changing one note, which maybe goes out of the key. Then you start to hear how notes that are outside of a, this would be a good thing to demonstrate, I didn't even think about, but to hear how notes outside of a key can work. If we play this A Phrygian thing again before we get into the song and see what the, I get that same kind of tempo. I'll start to introduce some outside notes, what I would call out of the key. Mm -hmm. One, two, oh, one, two, three, four. Interesting. Not, I don't know if that was exactly what I wanted to do, but uh, try to show how you could use that same phrase and use it as a sort of a, a, a springboard for your improvisation. So you could play around that phrase if you were playing on a static harmony, so that you wouldn't always play in the key. You could move chromatically away from the key, but coming back to the key always gives it that flavor. If you just stayed out of the key all of the time, there would be no sense of coming back, there would no be, no be no sense of being out of the key because you'd be out all the time. So you need that relationship, uh, the, the tension, the harmonic tension maybe. But now let's take this idea of motivic development because when you apply it to a chord progression it takes on another whole uh, a meaning. Now we're going to take a standard chord progression and I'm going to try to use some kind of a motif that's going to lead me through all of the chords. I won't play them literally on each chord but I'll, you'll hear the motif. I already know what it's going to be. So we do 
a tune. That turned into more of a, of a full-length performance, which is great. So I hope yeah. some of the material was like was clear. We can slow some of that down too. But I was trying to be, and, and John too, would be very clear in terms of the, like using a motif to play mm -hmm. like, like here are the changes, you know. G minor seven, C seven, F. D minor to G minor to E minor to A7, B minor E, E minor to A. And the whole thing kind of repeats, more or less. And a little turnaround. 
F7, E7, A7 to D minor. And the changes go back. It's a very modal sounding tune. It's, it's a kind of tune that's very easy to, uh, that kind of chord progression is very easy to get lost in because you never know. There's no real bridge to the song. It's not an AABA song form, so you don't know where the heck am I, you know. John, when you think about improvising on a tune like that, a lot of people would <clears throat> look at each chord, maybe decide what they want to play on each chord. But the feeling I think you get is more of a, a larger sense of the tonality. That it's more of a palette, you know, if you were a painter or something. Um, yeah. I hear it the way you play, so you think of it more mm -hmm. in, a, in a, a longer sense as opposed to each individual chord. Um, this is true, yeah. I think that also has to do with the not only the harmony of the piece, but the rhythm of the piece. In other words, mm. if, I'm, if I think of um, the beat as it's going by, I mean, I'm not thinking of, like, that tempo was the one, two, one, two, three, four. I'm not thinking of every beat, like, one, yeah, two, three, sure. four. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'd get tired get very real quickly. Old. Real, real old, old fast. real fast. Yeah, so <laughs> what I try to do, and I think what a lot of players do, is you just try to think in a longer rhythmic scope. So instead of thinking of every beat or every quarter note, I'm thinking of, like, one. Two, one. Those are a bar. One, two, three, four. Two, two, three, four. Uh, so all of a sudden, I'm not like trying to cram anything yeah. in. My whole and my whole body relaxes, which allows me to be maybe think further ahead or think in a longer mm -hmm. sense. I might see like a whole series of chords as one long progression, you mm -hmm. know. So it's not just like chord, 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 stop, chord, chord, chord. It's a song, and you have to keep in mind that you're playing a song, and there's a lot of motion to this to this harmony and you were trying to like kind of like like my friend Mick used to say there's a, a, a harmony is like a like a big circle it keeps going around and you're trying to sometimes navigate play a straight line through this stuff maybe we could play that one again and just take mm -hmm. it and I'll try to be even really clear because I think this is an important aspect of letting the tune play you I hear when you when you're when you're improvising on it I hear what changes in other words, what, what stays the same throughout that whole tune? There's really only two or three notes that kind of change yeah. on certain chords, and sometimes you emphasize those, and it gets real clear. Well, I think that's um, it, trying to emphasize certain uh, peak points of, of, a, of a chord progression, that is the, the third of a chord, the seventh of a chord. Yeah. This comes from thinking of intervals again, too, and, and starting from a, intervals and triads, because you begin to hear the relationship between where you are and where you're going to. Instead of thinking of a scale, you're thinking of voice leading and melody. So maybe I'll play one more time, just a couple of choruses, real simple, because I got a little carried away the last time. I want to make this one real clear. Okay. But I like to get carried away. Okay. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> tune talk about going to it you go to another bar then at that point um, so that's trying to use more motivic development and sometimes you can use one phrase almost to take you th guide you through a whole song that's what I was doing just like one whole phrase or one melody idea if you go back and listen to part of that what I just played it was I was really following one idea through the entire cycle of chords very much like one string playing 
hearing what you play. It's not about licks. And they have their place too, believe me, I've learned some. And you need to have that in your vocabulary too. You need to have some, some other things that you can call upon. That's because that's what we're really talking about is a whole language here of how to play, how to improvise. Mm -hmm. It's a language. You know, and when you don't learn a language, you don't learn, uh, I mean, you don't walk in and, and, and go to a uh, French lesson and, and come out learning French the next day or trying to speak entire conversations. You learn a phrase, you learn a word, you know. Hmm. You know, where is the restaurant, you know. I need a doctor, you know, I need, I, where's my intervals? Yeah, well, those are my intervals. I need my intervals. I need my triads. Well, I put those together. You know, I'm building a sentence and I'm starting mm -hmm. to speak. Because when, when we're playing, we're really speaking. And, and the hard part of it to talk about all this is obviously would be the expression behind it. Because I go a lot from intuition and I know John plays very much the same way. And I think a lot of the really the really good players and players that I followed and admired played that way. They played from their intuition. So that's why you'll hear notes that so you'll go like, what the heck was that note? What was that? You know, you get out your pencil and paper, you go like, well, that's not in the scale, that's not in the chord, how dare he, that's wrong. Excuse me, Mr. So-and-so, did you know that uh, Sonny Rollins played a B flat in the last, it's not important. What's important is the, how, the expression of it, how they arrived there. So you'll hear really good players play notes that would be technically considered wrong, but I can tell you that there are technically no, no wrong notes to play. You can play any note you want against any chord. This will really mess up people. But I remember years ago, I asked a friend of mine who's a wonderful piano player, I said, or he too, he's telling me, we're talking about chords and their available chord scales. And he said to me, John, you know what the available chord scale for G, uh, G7 is? I went, no, Carl, what's that? He said, it's G, G sharp, A, a sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, the whole chromatic scale. Sure. I said, oh, gee, that's, that's kind of far out. He said, you know what the available chord, chord scale for C Lydian is? I said, no, Carl. He said, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F. I mean, we were kids, and he was making a very strong point, but he was doing it like it was a joke. But it was the heaviest joke I ever heard because it was absolutely true. I mean, you know. And that kind of broke down the notion of scales for me at a certain point. Like, it's not necessarily to have to think of these scales. It's necessarily to think about, like, direction, expression, motion. And one of my teachers mm -hmm. said to me years ago, who was a very conservative player, he said, or not very conservative, but he said, he said to me something I didn't expect one time. He said, if you hear a melodic idea in your head, and even if it's outside of the chord, if you hear it strong enough and play it with conviction, it will work. And if somebody asks you why you played that, you'll say, because I heard it, and I felt it. How about dynamics? What do you, how do you, how do you, uh, do you think about that a lot? I'm because it's as a real, as I can, John. It, <laughs> it's a real oh. natural part of your playing. I hear certain things kind of whisper. Yeah, this certain is, I'm glad you, come, you brought that up, because that's. Um, it's like we speak, you know, sometimes I may yeah, speak right. very soft, sometimes exactly. I may get animated. Excuse me? Oh, I speak very <laughs> excitedly, you know. Yeah. How no, do you I, feel about that? What? Uh, hmm. oh, exactly, I use dynamics are the, are the big part of it. I mean, if yeah. I played a, if I was improvising on a tune and everything I played was like, you know, oh, I'll get a better sound. I mean, you get bored very quickly. I'm already bored. I mean, mm -hmm. but if I took the same, if I was playing, like, maybe not the same phrases, but similar phrases, you know, eighth note type lines, and I use more dynamics in them, they would all of a sudden have more meaning. Dynamics are an extremely important part about it, I mean, a, a part of it all. Um, and that, that comes under the heading of, like, phrasing, you know, and I think when we're talking about working on individual phrases or motifs, that's what you get into. You eventually arrive at making musical phrases. And that's, what you, that's what you really want. I mean, that's what you're going for in the end is a, is a musical phrase and putting together of ideas. And really what you wind up arriving at 
where I hope I arrive at in, in the best sense is the, the improvisation is kind of like a composition. My best intentions are when I improvise is to create some kind of new composition over the existing one. And if it's a standard song, that I, like some of the songs I love so much, I try to also pay very close attention to the song. Because the ones I play really well, I feel that I wrote them. I feel like they're my songs, you know. Mm -hmm. John, one of the um, uh, characteristic points of your compositions and your writing is polychords. And we haven't talked about that yet today. Um, no. Various triads over various bass notes. Um, how do you think of them? How do you come up with them? Uh, what might be some uses for them? And uh, maybe we can demonstrate a few of those sounds. If we can break them down into what their you know, yeah. lowest common denominator is, so to speak. You know? I think they're, they're the kind of sounds that, that, that I arrived at by when I first moved to New York and met, and met people who were writing this kind of music and recording this kind of music. Friends of mine like Ralph Town or Richie Byrack. People who were actually actively involved in writing this music. I didn't know what it was, so I sat down one day at a piano and I took a melody note, I remember, and I hit a bass note in a lo much lower octave. And I continued down with a, a lower, another bass note. So I was really just playing bass notes and melodies. I repeated it again, and then I started to say, well, here I have a melody note and a bass note. What if I fill in the middle? What's that going to sound like? I mean, I could fill it in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But I decided on this triad, which was a G triad with F in the bass. Keeping the melody note basically the same and moving to a B flat triad with E in the bass. So the bass is moving down, the melody is basically staying the same. And then to an E flat in the bass. chromatic melody that moved up and I filled in the this melody note and bass note with a chord which is it turned out to be a D flat over C so I had this kind of this song was developing so I had that much of it and at the same time I had come up with this little little funny uh, I don't know what you call it like a um, it's like a motif, but like a little uh, vignette, this little thing I came up with, which is based in thirds. This was all done on the piano, not on the guitar. It almost sounds like a little kid's, like... Yeah. Yeah. A little children's melody. Children's melody, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I knew this was an A minor with the flatted sixth, or raised fifth. In this case, it would be a raised fifth. Right. So I basically had this melody So I was, in, I was writing a tune that had polychords in it, but I didn't really know what they were or how to deal with them at the time. I just wrote the song from sound, basically from bass note and melody note, and fill in the middle. What's in the middle? I don't know. Let's try different things. You know, it was an experiment, and it turned out to be a song called Ralph's Piano Waltz. You know, and then I had to, because uh, it was written on Ralph's piano, and it is a waltz. Is that the first tune you wrote with polychords? I think this was the first tune I wrote with polychords. Mm -hmm. But then I had to, to figure out how to play on this thing, you know, because mm -hmm. it was, for me, it was like foreign territory. I was still used to 2-5-1 traditional harmony, but I loved this sound of these chords, but I didn't know how to improvise. That's where the scalar approach mm -hmm. came in handy, or, or knowing what the scales were. I know I haven't mentioned much about modes or scales in this tape, and I've been purposely trying to avoid using the word mode because it's used so much. I mean, I wanted to talk more about how to make music from all this stuff. So that's what I did. I took these, I broke this particular song down into the modes that would fit it. And I did, I applied some of my own principles to it as I practiced intervals and triads from it. And eventually I learned how to play this thing. It took me a long time though. Mm -hmm. But that was my first uh, real run in as a, a, comp a composer with polychords. And that's how, when I talk about improvisation as being composition, I do try to think like that when I, when I improvise to a certain extent. But when you compose like this, you really, then you are like, you know, a, a painter or someone who has time to change things, you know. Mm. That's what I love about, you know, and that's the way I think you can practice. It's one of the ways you can practice. I mean, everything I'm telling you on this tape and everything we're talking about are just my own personal opinions, my own feelings. Uh, 
about music, which has come over a long time of playing, many different styles and with many different people. So there's lots of different ways to go about it, but I do believe that part of your practicing should be writing, you know, or, or dealing in the area of composition, whether it's just improvised or whether it's something you're going to actually commit to paper and put your name on it and say, I wrote it. Uh, it's a real helpful, extremely helpful tool because that's really, again, it's helping you hear. I mean, everything about it that I'm talking about seems to come back to the same place. When I, and when I analyze it in my own brain, I say, oh, I'm talking about hearing what you play, composing, writing. It has to do with hearing. It doesn't have to do with licks and scales as much as it has to do with taking what those tools can offer you and making music out of them. That's what we're trying to do anyway, and all the good players do sure, it. Sure. Yeah, theoretically, you could put any bass note over any triad. I think um, Absolutely. In, in Mick's book, there's an exhaustive display of what's possible. I'm sure with um, Mick, there's an amazingly <laughs> uh, yeah, so comprehensive can, study, because he was a, such a, a whiz at that sure, stuff. Sure. But I think this is just a, this, this is another way of playing, and it's, it's uh, again, it's, uh, it's not removed from the standard 2-5-1 progressions, but it's, uh, it's just a different way of looking at things. In other words, you could analyze some of these chords in terms of, like, if you were a bebopper and you didn't know what G over F, the first chord in my song is G triad slash F. If you didn't know what that meant, you could look at that as a G seventh with an F in the bass. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you know that old kind of resol right. resolution thing they have with the seventh in the bass going to the third of a major chord. So if you were a classical composer, you'd understand that. You know. Well, it's important to look at these chords in more than one way. Yeah, exactly. You know, so this could be G seventh with F in the bass. And somebody says, oh, I know the mode for that. It's G, Mixolydian, thank you. You know, and you get a little bluebird on your paper, you know. But that's one way to look at it. The other way is to say, oh, it's, if it's G seventh, then it's just G seventh. It could be this. That's, that's approaching it more from a, a traditional point of view. That's saying, oh, this is not a triad over bass line. This is just G7. I'll just play some blues on it. You could do it that way. That's totally legit. That's just another way to look at it. And that's what I like about playing this kind of music, is you can look at things from different ways, and you can bring in different influences. There's no one way to do this music. So I guess that's what I was telling, telling you in the beginning of this little rap or whatever it was. There's no one way to do this. But I think a good part of your practicing, or a certain part each day, or during the week, could be improvisation equals composition. Just if you thought about it like that, you might write a tune. You might write four bars. That's a lot. Those four bars, could, you could learn a lot just writing four bars of music, more than you could and just try to hammer out a bunch of predetermined licks you'd worked on. You'd learn more about what you're about in relationship to music, not what somebody else did. It's important to analyze and scrutinize and, and do record transcriptions, but it's also very important to spend some time with yourself and find out what you're about, what it is you want to play, what do you hear. That's why playing rubato, like we did on some of these changes when John was comping for me, I believe that that's a really great way to play because it's slowing down the whole process. You're not in a hurry. Let's, you know, let's live with these sounds for a while and see what we can learn from the music instead of trying to always go into a musical situation ready to impose some idea on it. Be open to letting the music teach you a lot of things. And that's what composition does. It teaches you, or it does for me, anyway. Anyway, now I think we we've talked enough about composition, at least about this song. So now it would be nice to, to hear a complete performance. So now we'd like to play Ralph's Piano Waltz. <laughs> Thank you. 
And that pretty much covers a lot of the things I wanted to get to in this tape. Great. Talked about intervals, talked about uh, breaking up sounds and harmonies, scales, whatever you wish to call it, into, into smaller groups like triads, note groups, talking about playing um, two notes per measure, concentrating on playing good notes, good rhythm, four beats to the bar, a melodic bass line approach, again, good notes, good rhythm are important. Playing on one string, developing a, a melodic sense. Avoid playing licks. Playing what you hear. Uh, motivic development, as opposed to scalar playing. Again, it's taking an idea or a theme and turning it inside out, using it over different changes in a song. And uh, improvisation equals composition. And finally, the, the rhythmic aspect I've been talking about here. And it's a lot of, lot of material, and it, it, it would be, you could probably spend like 10 videos or, or more on each individual su subject, because it's all incredibly important stuff. And this combined with probably transcriptions, which I think are absolutely important, but should be watched. You can't, if you overdo it, you get, it gets very, very, uh, what's the right word, uh, predictable. I think a little bit of transcription goes a long way, whereas this kind of, improvising can really carry you on and, and nourish you and feeds you in a way that you can just go on for a long time 
learning all the time, leaves a lot of room for development. So I'd like to leave you with that, and, and John and I are now going to play a blues, and just, uh, I won't think about incorporating anything, because usually I don't. All I ever do is play. <laughs> and that's what I'll do. Thanks very much. This is a blues in B-flat. Thank you.